Renovating a vintage horizontal twin cylinder model steam engine. This is part 9. Shown on screen at the moment are the eccentrics and the eccentric rods, which were easily the worst parts of this engine. I'm about to use the polishing spindle to clean up this lot. These are the main bearings, the main bearing caps and the crossheads. Not forgetting the pair of gland nuts on the right hand side of the picture. So here are the polished items. The bearing top caps, the outer main bearings and the inner split bearing shells. And they're all now ready to be fitted back on the engine in their rightful place. All of the parts of this engine are carefully numbered as you can see here. I'm not a great fan of this, I don't mind the numbers but I wish they wouldn't put them in such a visible place. But that's the way it is. So each of the half bearings has a number, which goes into the corresponding slot, which also has a number. And this of course makes for a very easy and accurate reassembly of the parts, especially on engines that are not very well made. But with this engine, because it is very well made, the numbers are a little bit superfluous, everything fits really well. Even though I'm not showing this on the video, I tried the bearing parts in different places and they still fitted perfectly. So with the bottom half of the main bearing shells in place, a spot of oil on each of them, and I can sit the crankshaft across them. By rotating the crankshaft in these two bearing shells, it shows that there's a little bit of dirt in the bottom of one of them, and before I finally put the engine back together, I will clean this out. When I put the top bearing shells in place, they're quite a good fit. There is a little bit of play though, and this will be taken up by adjustment of the bearing top caps, but I'm just curious to see whether they work the other way around. So I'll swap them over, and no they don't really, the better the first way around, which is the way they are numbered, so that would teach me to try and be clever. It's quite obvious that the man who originally built this engine really knew what he was doing. It's a very well made engine as I keep saying. Even though I wipe the bearing shells with a cloth before assembling the crankshaft, I'm picking up some of this black stuff, the reason for this is because the shells were never a particularly tight fit on the crankshaft anyway. This will soon disappear when the engine runs. This semicircular mark on the main bearing has been caused by the crank web rubbing against the bearing when in operation, and it also confirms that the bearing shells are the correct way around. Here I'm fitting the outer bearing shells, and these are different to the ones in the center. For the simple reason these can be slid onto the crankshaft, but the middle bearings cannot be slid on and off the crankshaft. This was the bag that I labelled earlier, main bearings, and the reason for that was I put the main bearing bolts in it so I wouldn't get them mixed up with other parts of the engine. Before fitting these bolts, I cleaned up the heads on the polishing spindle, just to shine them up a little bit, as they were quite rusty. At the moment, and running at a higher speed than normal, is the fitting of the top caps. I put each bolt into the top cap, and give it a quick twist to seat it into the thread. And then using a socket on a simple screwdriver handle, I tighten up the bolts and give the crankshaft a quick spin. It's running very freely at the moment, but the bolts are not very tight, so I add a little bit of machine oil and tighten the bolts further. You really must be very careful doing this. It's not a good idea to shear off any of these bolts. After the crankshaft is adjusted and running sweetly, it's time to fit the crossheads. As can be clearly seen in this clip, the crossheads are also numbered so it's not rocket science to figure out where they actually go. I do believe that I mentioned when dismantling the crossheads that you only need to take one side off, not both. When I'm replacing the crossheads in the crosshead guides, I only need to move just one of the crosshead guides to allow the crosshead to be inserted into position and then swing back the crosshead guide, put the spacer in and fit the bolt. I've mentioned before that with this engine, surprisingly, none of the bolts I've come across so far have been sheared. And as I get to the end of the rebuild, it's looking like none of them are sheared. So that's congratulations to the builder and congratulations to anyone who's worked on the engine in the past. It is really easy to snap these bolts if you put too much pressure on them. I'm using just a screwdriver handle style driver for the socket, as you can see here. And even with this, I could shear the bolts. So if you're doing a job like this, be very, very careful. If it's a bigger engine with quarter inch bolts, you can still shear those but you'll need to be really ham-fisted to do that. Here I'm removing the bolts from one of the big end brasses, ready to fit it in position. I've been spending an awful lot of time at the polishing spindle lately. I've even cleaned up the end of these bolts you can see here. But I've cleaned up most of the engine parts on the polishing spindle, 
Some of these parts were really bad and there's been much grinding and polishing going on. And the engine's looking much better now. This clip shows me applying the oil to the big end brasses and the bearing surface on the crankshaft. It's very important to make sure that you do not get any dry spots because if you were to forget about it and run up the engine when everything was dry, in no time at all, both the big end brasses would be damaged as well as the big end bearing. Correct bearing lubrication is quite a science and I'm no real expert on it. I would be generally using a mixture of steam oil and machine oil for an engine like this because the big end bearing is not going to get too hot by conducting the heat from the cylinder. But if it's a smaller engine you're using, then steam oil is the best stuff to use because it will cling to the bearing. I like a combination of both really because the oil remains clingy but is thin enough to lubricate between fine surfaces. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.